Hello and welcome to Quarries and Nature 2021, a 50 year success story. We're here at the Somerset Earth Science Centre in the Mendip Hills and this lovely lake is right beside a working quarry. Every year, hundreds of children come here to learn about the quarrying industry and to enjoy the wildlife and biodiversity. And with the rain falling today, it's the perfect opportunity to do a bit of pond dipping. The education centre here was designed by the local Mendip quarry producers to help the industry connect with the next generation. And we're here to showcase and celebrate half a century of the UK quarrying and minerals industry, caring for the environment, nature and our landscape. It's one of the industry's best kept secrets, but it's time to put all that hard work and commitment into the spotlight. All these beautiful landscapes were once quarries. When rock and mineral products have been extracted, quarrying companies restore the land. The products like sand, gravel, clay, granite, sandstone, limestone and many others are all used in building our homes, our offices, transport, energy infrastructure and our schools and hospitals. Now a restored quarry might look exactly the same as it did before the quarrying started, but often it's an opportunity to enhance the landscape and its ecology for the better. Wetlands and reed beds, woodland and hedgerows, heathland and grassland, and high quality land for farming and production. You might have heard a lot of talk in the past five years about net gain and natural capital. In the future, industries that use or develop land will have to calculate biodiversity losses and the environmental costs of what it does and then deliver improvements in biodiversity through restoration. Well, time now to look in more detail at this 50 year story of restoration and conservation work. I've been finding out more from Nigel Jackson, the chief executive of the Mineral Products Association. We met up at Brett's award-winning restoration site at Church Lammas in Staines. This morning we're on a site that's uh, very important to me, but also very important to the industry. We're in Surrey, we're near Staines, and we're very much in the urban fringe. You may even be able to hear the background noise from the M25 and occasionally from Heathrow, which is just about a mile or so up the road. Now this site now is really a wildlife haven. It's an oasis, which in the urban fringe is probably more important than restored quarries in rural settings because local people need places for their mental well-being, for their physical well-being. And this site, which was designed with use by the community and wildlife in mind fulfills all of those aims. It's a very popular site, although it was a very unpopular proposal at the time. In fact, it was fiercely contested. But the scheme actually is a landmark scheme insofar as on highly designated land where the county council and the locals had some concerns about what the restoration would be like, uh, we were able to demonstrate that we could actually deliver and deliver in spades. This site was worked some 20 years ago for sand and gravel, which supplied important uh, construction projects in the London and the Surrey area as part of the essential supply that the industry provides. Without the sand and gravel, there would be no concrete, and without the concrete, we wouldn't have most of the built environment, whether it's roads, schools, hospitals, or homes. So it's fulfilled a vital role in keeping the economy going, and now it's fulfilling a vital role in contributing to nature. I visited this site quite a bit this week in preparation for this event and I'm absolutely blown away by what I've seen. It's turned out so much better than uh, we ever imagined 
and uh, I know if I was a local I'd probably be out here every day. It's fantastic. Well, Nigel, it's great to meet you on a sunny morning at a quarry restoration that you were personally involved in. You must feel so proud when you look out over this lovely lake. Well, firstly, uh, it's great to see you and have you here at Church Lammas in, in Staines. And yeah, pride would be an understatement. You know, it's just, uh, I mean, you know, I love this industry. And one of the reasons is because it does this. Uh, it's probably just one of those best kept secrets of the industry. Most people don't appreciate what a force for good we are just with the economic, you know, providing the materials for the economy, I think is fantastic enough. And then you have this. Talk about this 50 year story, because I imagine in those 50 years, a lot has changed. Well, I think 50 years ago, to be honest, when uh, quarrymen were extracting, they probably didn't have restoration at the front of their mind. But as it happened, when the quarry was exhausted, it didn't, it didn't mean that nature couldn't uh, play its part. It's a powerful force, as we all know. And I think the big difference is now, we almost start with how do we want the site to finish? That, so it's much more of a, an engineered, considered, designed process, as opposed to almost accidental nature. It's now wired in. So uh, yeah, I think I that's the big difference. I suppose 50 years ago, it was just a hole in the ground that would be left. And now the planning for that hole in the ground begins way before you even start extracting anything. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I've when I was looking for sites, when I was uh, sort of operational in the industry, when you were looking to find sites, obviously you've got to have mineral and it's got to be in the right location. It's got to have a, a chance of getting planning permission. But we're already thinking, of, even before we've acquired the land, how, how would this end? What, what could we do here? Um, because it's an important part of the planning uh, decision-making process to weigh up you know, the economic needs with the environmental needs. Well, you mentioned the economic needs. I think it's important in a way to talk now about exactly why we need minerals. We, we all need it. We wouldn't have hospitals, roads, schools. And I think sometimes people forget that, don't they? I don't think it's even, they don't forget it. They just don't know it. I mean, I spend way too much of my time and my colleagues and the industry at large trying to get people to make the link between why we need mineral and the way we live. It, it's, it's not accidental that we need about a million tonnes a day of aggregates, cement, concrete, industrial minerals and lime, agricultural lime. Uh, it's because civilization, civilised economies need those materials as much as we need food, water and energy. And it's interesting that you're talking like that in that we're right next to a restored quarry and we can hear the traffic racing along a road that would have been built, the M25, Absolutely. with lots of aggregate and minerals. Well, an aggregate actually, some of which was extracted from adjacent to the, to the line of the road. And Heathrow, of course, is continuously requiring materials for redevelopment, concrete for foundations, concrete for the structures, asphalt for the runways. A little known thing is, and I've seen it in, in action, when they're repairing some of the runways there, a plane will be taking off in New York whilst they're taking the asphalt <laughs> off the runway. And by the time it lands, the asphalt is ready for the plane to land. Well, let's talk about the scale of restoration that's happening now, because this is a 50 year story. You've talked about your personal involvement here at this lovely lake and this former sand and gravel quarry. What's the scale of restoration that's happening now right across the country? Uh, priority habitats already delivered, uh, an area the size of a significant city such as Nottingham. Uh, land already in the system, planned and will be delivered, uh, an area the size of Liverpool. It's pretty significant. But there's much more besides, that's just priority habitats. Um, I don't think we have the data readily to hand of how much land has been restored over 50 years, but it's pretty significant. And the MPA also has its virtual national nature park. Yeah. What, what's the idea, idea behind that and what is it? Well, the idea was, it occurred to us that 
because the assets that the industry has created are dispersed, they're not, they've not really got shape, form, scale and, and are not visible. So we thought, well, why don't we imagine them put together? What would that add up to? And uh, it adds up to, you know, a small national nature park, effectively. Um, there are 80 sites that we've already got that will grow over time. Uh, on those sites, there's not just restoration like this, but there are education centers, there are visitor centers, there are nature trails. Uh, it, for me, it's like the shop window of the industry and its commitment to nature. Nigel, it's such a lovely sunny day. Let's take a walk along the water's edge here and have a look over across on this bank. Look at all these beautiful willow trees and the reeds and rushes along the bank there. Yeah, that bank edge has come out better than we could ever have thought of designing. It's, it's really got a life of its own now. What really underpins the work that you do when you do restoration? What underpins all that work? Well, other than the, the obvious that if you want to get permission, you've got to demonstrate that you know, your environmental credentials and, and all that. I think that the step change for me was the industry developing a biodiversity strategy in 2009. Uh, at the time, we were the only industry in the country to, to make that leap. I think we still are. Uh, we were able to review and update that uh, um, after 10 years in 2019. And I still think we're, we're light years ahead of any other sector. Uh, I hear a lot of you know, good words and ambitious stuff being, being said by, uh, by other parts of business, but you know, we're doing it and we've been doing it for 50 years and there's a lot more to come. And you have your industry Oscars the Biodiversity Oscars, don't you, that recognise the good work that people are doing in the industry in restoring quarries like this? Yeah, absolutely. Every two years, uh, we like to showcase what members have been doing. Uh, we think that, firstly, we should celebrate you know, the effort they've put in. Uh, hopefully, it will inspire others. It, it, we can share you know, their experiences, which people can build into future schemes. And, and I think what it does, it just concentrates. It brings together that dispersed activity that's going on, that I referred to earlier, into one place every two years. And we can, we can share it with key stakeholders. And it's, for me, it's a really proud day because we've got all of the main environmental organizations with us. Uh, we know them, we want to know them, we want to work with them. We've got memorandum of understanding with a number of key partners, whether it's bumblebees, freshwater habitats uh, and, and many others, RSPB, the Wildlife Trust, they are all very, very key to us. And collectively, we drive the science and the, the practicing forward. Do you think people really appreciate what you do? Not do you, enough. Do you think people <laughs> even know that the quarry industry is involved in this grand scale restoration? I think on a local level where it's impacting on communities there will be a, an, a, an understanding. There may be there may be skepticism, there may be resistance, but I think over time when sites mature there may be that mood changes. But in terms of a general appreciation and understanding of a what the industry is there for, what it does, let alone you know, what it achieves in terms of contribution to nature. Not enough people know it. It's certainly not appreciated. And my biggest frustration is cutting through with DEFRA. Uh, my personal view is that they should be all over us like a rash, uh, <laughs> because what we're doing is what they're, they're, they're using the words, but we're actually doing it. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I work in farming and there's a lot of talk in farming about how subsidy is going to be linked public money for public goods. In a way, you've been pretty much doing that for 50 years, haven't you? This kind of, you've been putting your own industry's money into something like this that's open to the public. Well, it's perverse for me. I mean, public money for public goods, this is private money for public goods. Um, we, we pay our environmental taxes uh, and a lot, you know, for the thick end of a billion pounds a year. And we do this, we're not being incentivized to do this because it's the right thing we're doing it because it is the right thing to do so i do get a bit irritated i don't think there's a level playing field or an appreciation in government 
of environmental impacts across the whole of business and industry. I think we pay our dues. Uh, my members, I think, are very mature about it. They appreciate that they have an environmental impact and that they have to earn their, their license to operate. But I don't think that's applied evenly or equally across industry. Now, I've obviously talked to a lot of people in this industry. I think the thing that impresses me most of all is the passion of the people who work in this industry, the quarry managers, the quarry workers. If you go to a restored quarry, people are really passionate about putting it back to nature, giving back to wildlife. That must make you very proud, not only the work, but proud of the workforce as well. Absolutely. I mean, this is a this is an industry I, I find it impossible not to love. The people, what we do, why we do it, how we do it is, is just so, so important. Quarry managers are stewards, they're guardians. They, they're, very often they'll be there, not for years, but possibly decades. And it becomes part of their lives. It's all for some. I know everybody wants to be paid a fair wage for a fair day's work, but it's a way of life. And uh, I never cease to be impressed by the, the commitment that quarry managers and the, the people around them, because it, you know, they need expert input from other people in their companies to, to develop you know, uh, a, a, an outstanding outcome for everybody. It's fantastic. Well, should we just end by taking time out just to look at this lovely place? It's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Nigel Jackson, the Chief Executive of the Mineral Products Association. We're here at the Somerset Earth Science Centre in the Mendip Hills, based here at Wainwright's wonderfully named Moons Hill Quarry. Let's take a look around. And lakes and water like this lake here are a key feature of restored quarries. Here's Kaz Graham. If you've visited a wetland nature reserve, been bird watching at a reed bed, or enjoyed a lakeside picnic, you might not have realized that they were all once quarries. The mineral and quarrying industry is uniquely placed to enhance our environment. And in the past 50 years, the industry has been responsible for expanding habitats and increasing biodiversity right across the UK. Half a century ago, a lake or a pond at a former quarry was incidental, just a hole in the landscape. But the industry has embraced its duty to take care of the landscape. Restoration plans have evolved so that five decades on, the restoration vision is there right at the start, at the planning stage. Across the UK, wetlands, lakes, ponds and reed beds have all been created on sites of former quarries. Quarrying companies have used imaginative and innovative techniques to create fishing and conservation lakes islands, inlets and wildlife friendly shallow margins along the shorelines. Reed beds and wet woodland provide ideal habitat for waders, invertebrates and amphibians. Wet woodland and native trees are often planted on silt lagoons with coppicing and pollarding encouraging wildlife. Hedgerows, trees and grassland banks are contoured around the former quarries with open water and submerged features adding to habitats for wildlife. Former quarries are perfect for building nesting banks for sand martins, otter holts, and bat roosts. Breeding and overwintering birds make these former quarries their homes. Got a 
range of habitats on site. We've got the dry grassland banks, there are areas of wet grassland around the lakes, some quite significant areas of reed bed and um, aquatic margins, valuable species for species of dragonflies, as well as other invertebrates. We've got an area over on the west side of the site which has the former silt lagoons and that's developed over time as reed beds succeeded by quite a significant wet woodland habitat. It's quite a valuable resource for this part of Surrey which is um, quite an urban fringe area and quite built up. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite an oasis in the sort of like this suburban location, I think. These restorations are great examples of the industry working to enhance the environment, to create a mosaic of diverse priority habitats. Over the past century, our wetlands have been neglected in the drive for intensive agriculture and development. And as the climate changes, flooding is an increasing danger. But quarry restorations can be part of the solution with dynamic and ambitious river floodplain management. At former quarrying sites, lakes, ponds, swamps, marshes, fens and reed beds transform the landscape into a network of habitats which link to larger rivers. Flood water can flow freely through new channels via inlets and networks like these oxygenate the water, trapping silt and helping to control pollution. The natural life of a river can work with the restored landscape, recharging the water table and preventing flooding. People, of course, are key to the industry's restoration projects. And every year, half a million people visit the Cotswold Water Park on the Gloucestershire-Wiltshire borders. And the 40 square miles of 150 lakes and beautiful countryside are home to 22,000 people. There are 18 nature reserves, 64 fishing lakes and 19 lakes for water sports. Like many restored quarry sites, it's now a site of special scientific interest. This is a great example of how quarry restoration has evolved in the last five decades. Techniques have developed as restoration experience has grown and flourished. Ambitious restoration plans are now always there at the start of a quarry's life. Wetlands, lakes, ponds and reed beds created at former quarries often link in with the wider landscape and the mineral industry's ambitious restorations follow the principles set out by Sir John Lawton in 2010 in the Lawton Review. Sir John emphasised that the recovery of Britain's wildlife sites needed to be expanded, better managed and more interconnected and that their rich diversity underpinned our own survival. The MPA has recognised that with wildlife declining globally, modern development and intensive agriculture, isolated reserves are no longer enough to protect and preserve our ecology. The industry is committed to big ideas and large-scale action across whole landscapes. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently reported on the urgency for the world to create environmentally sensitive landscapes to combat global warming. Better use of land can contribute to tackling climate change, for example through absorbing carbon and storing water. Land is a critical resource and sustainable restoration of Britain's quarries is making a difference. So I'm David Powell, I work for Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, I'm the Assistant Reserve Manager for Ripon City Wetlands. This was a gravel extraction quarry which was quarried by Aggregate Industries. Uh, we've now taken it on from them, we're in the management phase of this site now and have had it for three years. A lot of the stuff here has come in naturally, a lot of the botanical things, a lot of the scrub has obviously come up from ground source. When we get a flood here, a lot of different things are brought in um, through seed distribution, obviously wildlife distribute a lot of seeds as well. A lot of our work now is working out how it's maturing, what's happening and where across the site and what we can realistically achieve through, through our management plan. For instance, some sections we're quite happy to let scrub over, other sections we're going to keep on working at, keeping them clear of scrub for botanical value. Certain times of the year we'll be doing 
particular things. This time of year we've been doing a lot of cutting and raking, clearing the grassland areas. This helps spread wildflowers rather than just grass. And it's got important botanical value for pollinators. We've also still been continuing work with aggregate industries in some of the lagoons to increase the habitat margin there. And it's all just, it's keeping the site developing whilst learning what it's doing naturally as well. The wetlands, ponds and lakes restored by the quarrying industry. And next, we're in the woods and meadows. Woodlands and tree planting are key to combating climate change and our meadows are now scarce and endangered. But huge areas of woodland, heathland and grassland have been created after quarrying. Some of these woods and meadows link up with established nature reserves creating landscape scale wildlife corridors. Some are smaller projects designed to encourage particular plants and wildlife. Kaz Graham has more. Our precious woodland, meadows and heathland are all under threat. According to Global Forest Watch, the UK has lost 13% of tree cover since 2001. And that's comparable to the rate of tree loss in the Amazon rainforest. Heathland has diminished by 85% over the last 150 years. And since the 1930s, we've lost 97% of our meadows. Protecting these endangered habitats has been a priority in quarry and mineral restoration projects. Recreating the thin, dry and nutrient poor calcareous soils of chalk and limestone grassland takes real skill from ecologists and the workforce driving the heavy equipment. It takes landscape scale vision to reimagine a quarry as grassland and meadow. And as well as the work with the big kit, there's laying hay by hand to reseed a meadow and getting the trowel out to plant native plant plugs. Heathland and acid grassland require a nutrient-poor acid soil and are characterised by open areas of heather and gorse with wetter, boggy areas, supporting a range of specialist animals and plants. Heathlands are home to adders, nightjars, Dartford warblers, lizards and a multitude of invertebrates. Black Hill is surrounded on three sides by the East Devon pebble bed heaths and they're a special protected area, special area conservation, and a site of special scientific interest. So really heavily designated for bird life, for flora and fauna. Lowland heathland in the UK has declined massively in the last, last 100 years. East Devon's one of the uh, few remaining hotspots, and Black Hill being located where it is, gives us a chance to expand on the, uh, on the lowland heathland in this part of the world. We hear so much about how important our woodlands and forests are for net gain, carbon capture and combating climate change. But tree planting has long been at the forefront of the quarrying industry's restoration projects. The industry is championing the rejuvenation of British woodland. At least 1.5 million trees and 112 kilometres of hedgerows have been planted in quarry restorations over the last 10 years. Plus, 40 kilometres of traditional dry stone walls have also been built. Large areas of woodland are regenerating our native trees and plants, helping our wildlife, birds and insects. The MPA is committed to restoring these habitats to ensure they'll thrive for future generations. It's a commitment born out of 50 years of caring for the environment. So we've come to the top of the quarry here at Rains where we're sat in some uh, calcareous grassland. It's a UK priority habitat and as part of our restoration plan, this is what we've um, created. But it also fits in with our biodiversity objectives. We work in partnership with the RSPB and they've, they've helped us here. And the sort of habitats that between us we've looked to try and create are all uh, important uh, for species diversity. So as well as the calcareous grassland, we've got exposed rock cliff faces, which is important for a number of birds, including nesting fulmers and kittiwakes, both of conservation concern. And we also have the rare chuff, which nests in the cliffs here. But that isn't the only uh, habitats we've created. Um, We've created mixed scrub, we've created lakes, and we've also created lowland woodland. And it's the combination of all these habitats in close proximity creating ecotones, which has driven species diversity. And when we monitor and record the species that we found on site, we know that there's hundreds of species on site. Uh, lots of butterflies, lots of wildflowers. 
there's 132 species of wildflower on site. So I think that's a testament to the way we manage the biodiversity. You can see the results when you're here. Uh, and obviously, um, going forward, we've got big plans to restore the quarry. So the objective would be to create more habitat um, as, we, as, we, as we start to restore the quarry. Some of the precious pasture and wonderful woodland restored by members of the Mineral Products Association. And as we celebrate half a century of restoration work in Britain's quarries, how's this work viewed by environmentalists, the government and the people who work in the industry? I've been finding out. A very considerable area of good quality habitat has already been created across the country as a result of mineral extraction. And sometimes this is quite a surprising fact because very often this kind of industrial development will be automatically received by many as environmentally destructive. It's removing maybe green fields, but actually what you get subsequently can be much better than the original green fields from the point of view of nature and biodiversity. And so to that extent, this is some, in some ways quite a surprising set of outcomes. But what it does tell us is that with a little bit of imagination, a little bit of forethought, we can actually achieve a great deal for the country in terms of nature, as well as extracting the resources we need for different kinds of developments. We can do the, both of those things at once. One of the things that we find uh, in the country today as we look at nature conservation is how we need to be going beyond where we've been for many decades now, which is hanging on to the last remnants of uh, good habitat, the last populations of rare and declining species, and now moving into a space of nature recovery. So it's not only any longer about keeping uh, the remains of what we had. It's very much now about restoration and doing that at the same time as achieving other outcomes that the country needs in terms of new housing, infrastructure, obviously food production and different industries will have a very important role to play in making that happen, including the minerals industry in being able to supply some of the resources that society needs at the same time as actively planning for the future of nature recovery at the same time. This can be done and we have many, many good examples across the country now of really very beneficial outcomes for nature that have resulted from minerals extraction. The MPA's Biodiversity Awards, I think, have been really important in inspiring people to see some of the possibilities at hand. And by setting out those examples of best practice, not only do we create a sense of possibility, but also actually share some experiences that can enable other people to do even better. And so that rolling programme of being able to draw out the very best examples, I think has been really important in keeping this ball rolling and not only keeping it rolling, but to increase the momentum that we now have behind this joined up agenda for these kinds of developments to be made as beneficial as possible for the environment. The future is very much about nature recovery, and we're going to have a lot of new tools coming soon through policy, including the local nature recovery strategies that will be enshrined in the Environment Bill and new tools like Biodiversity Net Gain. And the more we can line these different tools up through spatial planning that brings as many partners together as possible, then of course the more we will get done. The minerals industry I see as a critical key partner in this task, looking at how the future for nature recovery can be aligned with the kind of business strategies that the industry has so that we can achieve those long-term outcomes that everybody wants for biodiversity recovery. The Cotswold Water Park site of special scientific interest is, I think, uh, a very good example of the kinds of joined up outcomes that increasingly we can pursue uh, through partnerships in, into the future. And the special interest in that part of, of England has been created by the minerals industry. Had there not been minerals workings there, we wouldn't have a site of special scientific interest. And so insofar as society now wishes to pursue the objective of nature recovery and to increase uh, the biological interest we find in different landscapes, 
then uh, logically one would expect there to be an attraction for more mineral workings to be able to expand the interest that we already have there. And so the site of special scientific interest at the Cotswolds Water Park is not about saying there is no further development in that landscape. It's about saying that what we have is special and needs to be looked after, but also will be an invitation, I hope, for more collaboration, including an extension of that kind of landscape, creating even more of the same. And of course, that will arise from more mineral workings. Hello, I'm Craig Bennett. I'm Chief Executive of the Wildlife Trusts. And on this 50th anniversary, I just wanted to take a moment to celebrate the partnership working between the Wildlife Trusts and many members of the Mineral Products Association over many years. I mean, so many examples, but examples like that at Wollstone Fields in Warwickshire, just outside Coventry, where Warwickshire Wildlife Trusts have worked with Hanson and Smith's Concrete to create a new wetland there that is so important and so beneficial to the people of Coventry. Or indeed in Nottingham, where Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust have been working with Semex, of course, over many years to create new wetlands uh, at uh, Attenborough Nature Reserve, just on the outskirts of uh, Nottingham, meaning that that is really valued by local people in the city and indeed wider across the wider Nottinghamshire area and indeed it's got an education centre there that means that's making sure that younger people can connect to nature as well at Attenborough Nature Reserve in Nottingham or the example of up at Ripon where at Ripon City Wetlands and Yorkshire Wildlife Trusts have worked with aggregate industries to make sure we're creating a new spectacular assemblage of wetland habitats just on the outskirts of Ripon. Again, something that benefits nature and puts nature in recovery, but also puts the relationship between people and nature recovery at the same time. So let's celebrate that partnership working between the Wildlife Trusts and members of the Mineral Products Association. Well, let's take a tour of the country now to see what other people think. We start in the Cotswold Hills. Well, we're at Broadway Quarry, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, located on the northwestern edges of the uh, uh, Cotswold area of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, we're just uh, on the top of Fish Hill, uh, um, um, uh, above the village of Broadway itself, uh, on the edge of the escarpment, which looks over the, uh, the Vale of Esham. Uh, the quarry uh, has been here since the 1890s, we believe. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and has worked uh, local Cotswold stone for local buildings. In fact, some of the uh, buildings in uh, Broadway itself were built with the stone from here. And uh, Smiths have bought the quarry since 1986, <coughs> um, uh, where they, they've worked the stone for building stone and aggregates. And the sites are now being restored uh, with an emphasis on a focus on, uh, na on nature conservation and geology. Well, you've seen some of the wonderful work being done here at Broadway Quarry. Let's talk to John Bell now, who's the operations manager for the quarries for Smiths. You must be so proud of what you've achieved here. Yes, it's really good. Um, we're giving something back to an area that has been quarried out, and that's probably the way forward for how we're, we're moving across many of our sites. It's something where we're creating diverse landscapes from what has been agricultural plain land in the past and we're moving that forwards. And what do you think about this quarry now? When you look around, and you must have seen it when it was a quarry, yeah. and now you look at it, it really is an incredible sight, isn't it? You, you've got some beautiful habitats being created. To be fair, some of which existed when the quarry was in operation. The birds, the peregrines were around then. Um, but yes, we've got so much more opportunity to, to get different species involved and open it up for... Um, yeah, for more wildlife. We've travelled a few miles down the road from Worcestershire to Oxfordshire to see Smith's Duns Tube Quarry and this really impressive restoration project at the Horsehave West Nature Reserve. So the idea of the restoration was uh, primarily for conservation and biodiversity. 
Um, we've got a, a shrubland, which is a shelter for, for many animals, including birds. Uh, the idea was, that in terms of geology, was to leave the face, which is behind us now, 230 metre face, ultimately for uh, a colony of uh, sand martins that have been returning since about the 1950s, 60s. Um, so since the 1980s, they've been recorded in their numbers up until, obviously, this year, we had up to about 100 um, pairs. Um, that's the main objective, really, is, is to increase habitat and biodiversity. Here where the River Great Ooze spills into the Cambridgeshire Fens, a reed bed is taking shape. Hansen and the RSPB are transforming a former sand and gravel quarry into the Ooze Fen Nature Reserve. And when Ooze Fen is complete, it'll be the country's biggest reed bed. Well, if you came here in the late 1990s, um, you would have found uh, a large intensive area uh, farmed intensively for lots of crops, um, a massive area over 700 hectares which has now been transformed through the extraction of sand and gravel, about two metres, three metres depth, and the overburdens on top, which is about over a metre, have been placed back in the landforms to make a very intricate habitat. Um, so that transformation from a, a large area of intensive farming has been done in a phased way through the extraction of gravel and the direct placement of overburdens as we progressively restore the wetlands. So we're, we're seeing a phase that is restored and we are advancing with the extraction as well. Um, I'm very proud to invo be involved. I've uh, been involved for over 30 years on the site now from the very start, the very first gravel pits we had at Barleycroft. And uh, it's great to see the progression through that uh, extraction and restoration as we gradually create um, the habitats as we work round, you know, within a, uh, the constraints of designing uh, with the overburns available and uh, to the brief of the RSPB, uh, the designs I have to come up, come up with in detail have to satisfy them and our operational people who dig the gravel as well. So it's quite a complex uh, balance to strike. I think the favourite bit um, is that uh, the detail really, the detail you'll see in the intricacy of the water areas and how that uh, magical edge habitat between water and land is, is very long compared to the area. So if you measured the, the linear edge of water, it's absolutely massive and, and creates that special habitat for the wildlife of this uh, type of reed bed area. And it's not just about reed beds, it's, uh, there's other habitats within to a lot of small scale ponds and uh, rough grassland around as well, but the, the reed bed is obviously the major feature to attract certain species of birds. When the quarry is restored, there's so many opportunities to create habitats that um, provide opportunities for all stages of a bumblebee's life cycle. So, for example, here we've got loads of flower-rich habitat, partly through kind of natural regeneration, allowing what wants to come through to come through. And they've also done a lot of reseeding work as well, planting wildflower seeds. So that provides the forage that bumblebee queens and workers need for their colony. And then all the landforms and the topography, all the humps and bumps and slopes, provide really excellent opportunities for bumblebee nesting and also hibernation where they can burrow into the ground to find somewhere safe and secure for the winter months. So of the 24 bumblebee species that we have in the UK now, around a third of those are of conservation concern. And so the work that quarrying, the quarrying industry can do um, before quarrying takes place and while quarrying takes place and during the restoration phase can help to create a huge mosaic of different habitat types, which can then help to support bumblebees in our landscape, lots of flower rich habitat. To help support those. Yeah. Bumblebee Conservation Trust have been really proud to be supporting the work of the MPA since 2012 which is quite early on in the formation of, of the trust so we've been involved for a long time um, and we've been really happy to support the work that's been going on across the quarrying industry restoring and creating amazing habitats for our bumblebees so we're really keen to continue that support and hope that the work continues long into the future. I think it's, um, it's realising that a lot of these nature reserves that you may have in your local area used to be a quarry. You'd never know that, um, but if you dig deeper, you understand what the, what the land use was and how they've restored it and they're managing it for wildlife. It's amazing, really, that you'd never ever know in a lot of these cases that it's a quarry at all. The pride and passion of the member companies, um, whether it be the quarry manager, the restoration manager, the landscape architects, the ecologists, 
it's so impressive. Um, everybody you deal with is committed to what they're doing. Um, they have great expertise, great experience, and they're delivering fantastic stuff all the time. I'm most proud of delivering something I believe in, actually. Um, nature conservation is, is my passion. Um, it's, where I, it's where I started my career. It's where I did my degree in, in ecology. And to be given the opportunity to work in this now is fantastic. So the partnership between the RSPB and the minerals industry is incredibly important for wildlife. The, the, the quarrying sector is one of the few areas where habitats are being created. Um, elsewhere, um, nature is in trouble. And so there's a real opportunity to do something really quite significant for lots of species, lots of habitats, but also very importantly, I think, for people as well, providing them with recreational space surrounded by nature. I think it's one of the very few industries that have made really, really strong efforts to create something out of what they've, they've exploited the land and then they're you know, committed to putting stuff back that, that has a value that is, is kind of beneficial as I say, not just to wildlife, but to people as well. And, you know, nowadays with things like climate change and so on, some of these habitats are able to offset some of those impacts to some extent. It's not the full solution, but it's, it's, a, it's a step in the right direction. And I think by planning and working with other stakeholders, the RSPB, other wildlife organisations, communities, the, the, the planning authorities, we can... We can plan and create better spaces for nature, better spaces for, for you know, surviving the, the sort of future environment as well. So restored quarries are incredibly important for bird life because what they do is they give us a kind of blank canvas to create new habitat. So if you think about something like reed beds, for example, we're losing a lot of our reed beds at the moment because of changes to intertidal habitat around the coast, rising sea levels, encroachment from development. And so it's fantastic to be able to create new reed beds, and here would be an example of that, and to do that for birds like bitterns, for example, which really need that habitat. And then they're also great for kind of what I would call dynamic new habitat. So things like scrub, for example, coming up. So nightingales love scrub and we're able to create that in a quarry setting as well. So they're fantastic in giving us that sort of um, that canvas to play with, if you like, to really create the best possible habitat for some of these bird species, which are really struggling elsewhere. Well, biodiversity around the world is in decline. So we've got a million species at risk of extinction around the world. We've got 41% of species in the UK declining at the moment. So creating the right kind of biodiversity habitat at scale is a really vital part of answering that problem. So what quarries enable us to do is to A, you know, create things at scale, so create enough of the habitat to really allow a species that likes that habitat to thrive, but also to be part of a joined up network of habitat in the wider landscape so that species can be more resilient to the kind of changes that are coming through climate change, for example. They need the space to be able to really survive that. So this is a great opportunity, basically. A quarry is an opportunity just to expand that, that, that scale and also to create the, exactly the right conditions. You know, birds, like every other species, need shelter, they need food, they need water, and they need enough of that to be able to really thrive. So I think partnership is key. And one of the things I love about quarry restoration, it's, it's nature organisations, it's planning authorities, it's quarrying organisations, you know, and local communities all working together to create these new habitats and partnership is going to be key because what we're all facing into is a twin crisis basically the crisis in climate and the crisis for nature as well and we know that we can tackle both of those together but we need to do it in the right way so you know if we want a more nature positive world and we all do believe me otherwise everything that we depend upon vanishes and if we want to be able to hit that trajectory to net zero then we've all got to play our part and We've often got to do that in partnership in order to achieve the scale of change that we need to achieve. Well done. Keep going. Keep working with us. And there's, there's something really brilliant that's going to come from this. The partnerships and the pride and passion of people working in the quarrying industry. Now, restoration plans for a quarry always focus on improvements to the environment and helping wildlife. But restorations don't always mean just nature reserves and lakes. 
There are a host of imaginative schemes that include high-grade land for farming and food production, public art, housing and recreation. With the right conditions, a former quarry is a blank canvas. With modern construction machinery and vision, the industry can create anything. Imaginative restoration projects create new and exciting landscapes for people to enjoy. Over the past five decades, restoration in the quarry industry has evolved and expanded. Each decade has seen new, exciting and visionary projects. Alongside biodiversity restorations, the industry has pioneered multi-purpose restorations of former quarries. Farming, football pitches, footpaths, sculpture, shopping and housing have all found a home at the end of a quarry's working life. Across the country, crops and livestock that feed the nation are grown and reared on land once worked by the diggers. Construction waste that can't be recycled is moulded into rich farmland with lakes, woodland, hedgerows and wildlife corridors. Once we had achieved the desired landform with grading out the silt lagoons and the bund walls, the peat was used to cover the area. It was then ripped and cultivated to combine it in with the sandy substrate to form a soil forming substrate which was suitable for the establishment of grass. In South Gloucestershire, a very large hole has been turned into a unique development of housing, shopping and wildlife. Local people wanted more housing close to the town centre and this former quarry is now a mix of retirement, social and private homes. The former quarry face is now a site of special scientific interest and a wonderful place for people to enjoy. The Coldstone Cut in Yorkshire is an awe-inspiring public artwork, 1,400 feet above sea level in one of the UK's highest quarries. It was created when the sculptor Andrew Sabin worked with local people to provide a spectacular piece of art that also educates people about the industry. And most poignant of all the quarry restorations is the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire, sited in a former gravel quarry. The Arboretum honours those who lost their lives in both military service and in civilian life. More than 300,000 people visit the 400 memorials set amongst 25,000 trees every year. And it's great to be here at the Earth Science Centre here in the Mendips in Somerset. It's a great example of the quarrying industry looking after nature and educating young people about ecology and biodiversity. We are celebrating 50 years of the quarry and minerals industry restoring the countryside and caring for the environment. And of course, geology, soils, water and the wider landscape do dictate the type of restoration that's possible. And quarrying plans always start with restoration in mind. Quarries are engineered structures and because they're unique and versatile, they can deliver a variety of landscapes to support biodiversity. But people are also at the heart of what happens at the quarry and the views of local people, local wildlife groups and planning authorities help shape a restoration project. And the quarry managers and their teams are often the unsung heroes and heroines here. They're the people who work with their local communities to create lasting partnerships. Restoration projects are determined by the local geology, soils and hydrology. But vital to any restoration work are the relationships between the people involved, the people living nearby, the community groups and the environmental and wildlife organisations. And no project can be successfully completed without an array of partnerships between the people doing the work and those who are directly and indirectly affected by the restoration. That also includes local councils, national parks and government bodies like Natural England and the Environment Agency. Mineral extraction and quarry restoration takes place over many years, 
and quarrying companies work hard to maintain good relationships with local people. The aim is always to leave an improved landscape which looks better, enhances biodiversity and improves conditions for wildlife and the ecology. Restored sites leave a long-lasting legacy and in many cases they're handed over to wildlife organisations which run them as nature reserves open to the public. In the past 50 years, with growing experience and knowledge of restoration, the industry has been able to nurture partnerships with many people and organisations. Members of the Mineral Product Association have worked with respected organisations such as the Wildlife Trust, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, the Freshwater Habitats Trust and the Bat Conservation Trust. And it's the industry's workforce who are the unsung heroes of these incredible restoration projects. The quarry workers themselves often develop a deep love of the environment and wildlife that surrounds their workplace. The quarry managers, the ecology officers, the planners, the mechanics, the digger drivers and many, many more people. Working with local people, our workforce has done so much to shape the ecological future of the British countryside. The partnerships created by the quarrying and mineral products industry working to care for the environment, nature and biodiversity. To mark 50 years of caring for the environment, the Mineral Products Association is highlighting 50 species that quarry restoration has helped to protect in the past half a decade. Some of our best loved and charismatic creatures, including some of the 960 priority species classed as under threat by the government.
The birds, wildlife and insects that have been helped over the past 50 years by restoration projects undertaken by members of the Mineral Products Association. And you can check out the 50 for 50 on Twitter at quarry underscore nature with the hashtag quarry nature 50. Now, one of the highlights of the year is the MPA's nature photo competition with the best images being included on the MPA calendar. Quarry workers and wildlife volunteers get out their cameras and capture the wonderful wildlife and ecology in operational and restored quarries. Here's a selection from this year's entries. Some wonderful photographs from working quarries and restored quarries, and so to our winners. In third place in our volunteers category, it's George Walthew for his photo of that beautiful otter in Kingsdyke in Cambridgeshire. In second place, it's the tiny adult wren feeding her young by John Kazanoff at Sorton Quarry in Devon. And our winner is Roy MacDonald and those amazing balancing feeding swallows captured at College Lake Nature Reserve in Buckinghamshire. Well done to everyone. And now to our employees category. In joint third place, it's Alan Bland from Sabelco and Ian Rumbelow from Tarmac for their wonderful images of the roe deer at Grand Court Farm Quarry in Norfolk and the elegant dragonfly at Gallows Hill Quarry in Suffolk. In second place, it's that dramatic picture of the female peregrine taken by Jeremy West from Tarmac at the Swindon Quarry in North Yorkshire. And our winner is once again, Dave Soons from Aggregate Industries and his marvelous mirror image of the common turn taken at the Cotswold Water Park. And I know Dave, you'll be tweeting about that. And if you want to check him out, he's at Spooner40 on Twitter. Well done to Dave and congratulations to all our winners. And do look out for the amazing nature, birds and wildlife on the MPA calendar 2022. Well, Nigel Jackson, the Chief Executive of the MPA, has joined me now, along with Lisa Saunders from Wainwrights, who are involved with the Earth Science Centre. Now, Lisa, we're celebrating 50 years of great restoration work. What about the next 50 years? What will you be involved in? Well, I think uh, the future is exciting. Um, we're spending a lot of time at the moment looking at um, a new sort of strategy, um, which will be focused around continuing the work we do around education and skills for young people and also other groups, um, as well as focusing on you know, our efforts around sustainability and biodiversity um, and making sure that we engage with um, our local communities. So, yeah, I mean, it's everything we've done in the past, but more of it and just making sure that you know, we provide value to all of our stakeholders, really. And that's such an important legacy for this industry it is. to leave in this area, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, the, just on the education and skills front, it's really, really important that we get people into our industry, young people. Um, the quarrying sector, you know, average age is over 50. So in years to come, you know, we may well have a, a shortage of skills. So we need to make sure we've got that throughput of people coming through. Um, and on the sustainability and biodiversity side of things, I think it's something which all businesses, all businesses need to be involved in going forward. Um, it's going to be a crucial part of business, you know, from a sort of corporate and social responsibility perspective and just really about doing the right thing. And we've seen today what a great centre this is. 
what do you personally feel when you see people here having a good time, especially young people? I'm really passionate about the centre um, for all the reasons we've just discussed, but it's just lovely seeing young people coming here on their school visits, um, having a fun day. I mean, they really enjoy the, the sort of practical side of things. You know, when we do pond dipping or we take them on quarry tours, so they get to really see what they're learning about, but in real life, so they can put things in context. Um, and years later, when we go into schools and we talk to them about apprenticeships and things like that, they sometimes remember the visit they've had um, and they talk about, you know, what a great time they, they've had. And that's really what our aim is, is to leave a, a sort of print on young people's minds so that when they come to, you know, the world of work, they think of us. Lisa, thanks for the moment. Nigel, all that really fits in with your future strategy, doesn't it, as an industry? Well, absolutely. I mean, we've celebrated... You know, 50 years of the past, but it's got to, we've got to turn our minds to how we can replicate that for the next 50 years. And Lisa's absolutely right. I mean, like many heavy industries, getting retaining people is the first the first aim, but replacing people who are aging and may retire or leave the industry is another challenge. And and just inspiring any young person to even think that they could have a career in uh, the quarrying industry and the related industries manufacturing is is a really big challenge but i think you know a center such as this is just inspiring and uh, i've been here and seen you know young young people learning about rocks and learning about extracting them and how they can be used and uh, you know it gives you hope that uh, that we can attract some of them in, into the industry in the future. It's just making, getting the message out there at scale. We've been celebrating 50 years of success today. How will restoration plans evolve, do you think, in the future? I think they're getting more and more sophisticated. Um, as we know that once upon a time, a quarry would have extracted the mineral and left the site and nature would have been doing the restoration for you, whether it was designed or not. Um, now it's about designing it from the outset. And uh, I think that process, that sophistication of process where ecologists, botanists and others are, are involved during the environmental impact assessment and the design stage is, is here to stay. And I think it will only become more and more important. And what about the government's environment bill? How is that going to impact, do you think, restoration work? Because, of course, industry is going to be compelled now to measure, quantify what you're doing and what you're putting back in the end of when, you're, when you finish what you're doing. So how is that going to impact, do you think? Well, to some extent, we're doing that already. And I think our concern on the environment bill is that uh, because it's predominantly driven by other sectors, housing in particular, where I don't think their commitment to, to nature has been so long-term or uh, proven as, as ours. It's very much designed around uh, development sectors. There's, there's just a danger that we're going to actually be inhibited from doing what we've done naturally over the last, particularly the last 10 to 20 years. And where is rewilding going to fit in to all of this do you think can it fit in well i think there's a case for it where it's right but not every site is going to lend itself to to rewilding and and i mean that's a that's a huge issue in itself i think our, our first responsibility is to operate sites to best practice so that, that that's acceptable to communities but importantly that when we've on completion we've left something which does justice to the landform, the landscape, and is a lasting legacy of the industry. And are you confident that you can actually measure what you're doing? Can you measure your natural capital? Can you measure what you're putting back? Yeah, I think we can, I think we do. Um, and, but I think the, the, proofs, the proofs in the looking, really, when you, when you walk across um, our, our industry's sites when they've been restored uh, it's pretty self-evident you know you can see with your own eyes the, the 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 speciation the habitats the variety the diversity of what what's been created and uh, I think as people get closer to the industry they start to 
see, feel and touch. They can see what, what it's capable of doing. And part of my job and my colleagues' job is to, is to tell that story and tell it well, which is precisely why we're doing this today. But of course, you know, as well as I do, that not everybody is a fan of quarrying. And the critics would say that you're exploiting natural resources, you're trashing the landscape. What would you say to the critics? Well, firstly, is, has the critic done any homework? Um, because there's uninformed criticism, which I don't have a great deal of time for, and there's informed criticism. But uh, I, would, I would say we're not exploiting resources, we're using resources for a purpose, and the purpose is to create a civilised and built society. Because very often critics don't make the link between why we're extracting the mineral. We're extracting the min mineral to help build your homes, build your hospitals, build the schools, build the roads, build the sewers, put the culverts under the road to get the water away when it's flowing. There are so many uses. That's why, you know, this is the largest heavy industry left in this country and in many countries. And it's, it's just not understood by the general public how essential, you know, mineral is to enable their way of life. We've been celebrating 50 years, half a century of good work. What are your hopes personally for the future? My go-to dream would be that when people say quarry they immediately think of nature that it's a it's a positive it's a force for good and uh, even better that they make the link between why we extract the mineral in the first place but they automatically think that quarry is going to be a great place for nature when they've finished Nigel thanks very much and thanks very much to you Lisa and to the whole team here at the Somerset Earth Science Centre. It's been great to see it. Thanks very much for that. And that's Quarries and Nature 2021, a 50 year success story. Mm -hmm.